Let's begin with prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day and for the time we can spend together studying the word. Bless us as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have lessons for you printed and they're being copied right now. Today is a little hectic. We're getting the camera set up, the TV set up, and all these other things. So <coughs> this will be done in the future. Okay. Um, we'll start by, I want to take you on a little travel log each time we start the lesson so you can become familiar with um, the book of Revelation because the prophecies in Revelation, Revelation is a book made up of 22 chapters. It has 404 verses. Out of the 404 verses, 276 are direct quotes from other places in the Bible. That's almost 70% of Revelation is quoted from someplace else. Many people stand up and say what they think it means. What I'm going to do is take you back to the Old Testament. Let me give you an example. In Revelation, it mentions six different times about a false image that will be set up at the end of time called the image of the beast. That comes out right out of the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 3. So I will not only take you to where it's mentioned in the Old Testament, give you the background and the history, but let you bring that then into Revelation where you understand the symbol and why and the setting that it's used so then you can understand it in the setting of Revelation. When I used to do these full-time publicly, I did seven a year all over the United States and here and in Canada. Um, I used to have a quiz for people in the first night they would come out to the meetings. We did this several nights a week and I went for like seven weeks long just to teach people and they loved it. But I had a questionnaire and asked people questions. Do you know anything about Revelation? It's in symbols. And I used to have a question on my seminar that said, Revelation is in symbols, blank to blank blank. And some lady wrote to confuse me. <laughs> so I put that question off the seminar, <clears throat> off the list, but it's not to confuse you. It's to preserve the book. Because Revelation has such powerful messages in it, it's to preserve it. Okay? If it plainly said it, because it gets very specific in Revelation, it points to different organizations that you know of today, and it says, because of this, and it maybe gives it a different name, and we'll go through all the different symbolism and what it means in the book of Revelation, and give you the background and history so you understand it, I'm going to take you to Babylon, Jerusalem, all different cities of the Bible, so you can see the background and the history. I want to start by taking you to Babylon today before we start, to give you a little bit of history and background. Background. I will take you to the, uh, I don't know if I have it in the slides today, but we'll get there. I have a picture of the ballroom that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar used, the grandson, according to the Bible, of Nebuchadnezzar, where he had his drunken party and there was the handwriting on the wall in Daniel 5. I have pictures of that room and I will show it to you. Now the handwriting on the wall is still not there. I wish it was, but they have calculated that it could seat a thousand people, and that's what the Bible says it was seating. Yes, sir? The wall is still in Berlin in the, in the, in the museum there. Pergamum Museum. I'm going to take you to the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. I've been there, yeah. and I'll show you the walls of Babylon. I have pictures of me leaning against the walls of Babylon because I've been there. Okay, you've been there too, so you know the things that are there. There's three main exhibits, and then there's a bunch of cool stuff in the back of that museum. I'm going to show you pictures of that to give you the background and the history so you won't have to guess at what Revelation means. You'll know specifically, now I know, because people say and have asked me, what is the mark of the beast? What is this one? What does that mean? I will take you and show you the background and the history, and when you bring it into Revelation, you'll say, that is so clear, and I can now understand it. Okay? If you have questions, you can just ask them anytime you want to, and I'll stop. If I get going too fast and you want me to slow down, I usually do this with large crowds, so it, you can just tell me that. But the symbol, universal symbol, <coughs> slow down, Gary, is this. Try it. Okay, when you do this, that means slow down. All right? Because I'm going to take you through the history and the travel log and all that stuff. Okay, any questions? What's, what's the symbol for go faster? Go faster. <laughs> all right, we'll get started. I'm not going to slow you down. Did we have prayer already? I don't think yes. we did. Oh, we did. Okay, okay so you did ask prayer. All right, let's go forward then. 
see if I can make this computer work. First time I've used this in a while. There we go. There's Babylon. This is an artist concept of Babylon. And I'm going to show you what the Bible says about Babylon. Babylon was divided into two parts. Upper Babylon and Lower Babylon. And it was divided in the city with a river. I'm going to tell you the background, the history, the name of the lady. But the queen of Babylon wanted the bridge put in. And so they drained the river at one point in time. They actually blocked it off. And I'll, when we talk about the fall of Babylon, I will show you how they did it. I will read from three different historical sources. Xenophon, uh, Herodotus, the Cyrus Cylinder, and Daniel chapter 5. And they all say the same thing, but they give you really cool details that help you understand Revelation in Revelation 17 and 18. So you can say, now I know what it means when it talks about the fall of Babylon, spiritual Babylon in Revelation. It'll all become real clear to you. Okay, so we'll just go through these. If I can make the computer work right. This is uh, Herodotus, one of the historians I'm going to quote from. Okay. Pastor. Yes. Excuse me, Pastor. I don't have the slides for your sermon. Oh, sorry. I'll give them to you. If you don't give me my keys back, I can't get home. They're on here, and it's called um, whatever it is in the bulletin. The yes. bulletin's out there. It's only the first two words. Yeah. Phenomenal success or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Yeah. This is another artist concept of Babylon. Babylon talk, is talked about in Genesis. In Genesis, I think it's Genesis 7, when the city of Babylon was first set up. And I want you to understand the name of Babylon, where it comes from. They built a tower. It's called the Escalia to the god Marduk. And I'm going to show you the uh, Pergamum Museum and the walls of Babylon and show you this, all kinds of drawings. But this is another drawing. But this shows the tower, the great tower of Babylon. Um, it's been destroyed. I can show you pictures of the base that's still there. I have pictures of that base. But the Bible talks about that. that the people came out of the ark and the flood and then they begin to build this tower to heaven. If you read uh, Rene Norbergen's book, um, I'm trying to think of this, he has two volumes out on it. It talks about the people before the flood. Okay, I get going with so many facts in my head, I have to think for a minute to play the right tape, and I have to push the right button. Sometimes it doesn't come out, but I'll remember it. Um, thank you, Jerry. He just brought the outlines for the lesson, so we'll pass those out a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, but he talks about this tower and um, he gives the background and the history and he talks about in his in Rene Norbergen's book as he researched it and looked into it that they were trying to make a world ruling power and make it kind of a, a tower of communication and he goes into more details there than I thought was even possible to understand okay Herodotus described the Tower of Babel Okay, and there's an artist concept. That's me. I'm the artist that drew that picture. Okay, <laughs> you wouldn't know that, but I like making digital pictures Aww. to illustrate That's the Bible. Nice. Okay, this is um, all of the signs of the zodiac. If you read in Daniel chapter two, and we'll get to Daniel two. I'm trying to give you the background and the history today, and we'll get through Revelation so you understand it. This is all the signs of the zodiac, and in Daniel two, it talks about all the different religions that were there and the philosophers and the wise men well this gives you the 12 different signs of the zodiac if you have the horoscope and stuff they believed in all of that concept and then Daniel comes into the mix believing in the Bible and the living God and he blows them all away with prayer and trusting in God showing them this is false garbage what I'm going to tell you about Jehovah is the right information okay this is um talks about it's the code of Hammurabi that they discovered and there's a symbol of a sun in there. Babylon introduced the concept of sun worship early on way back in history. Okay, here's another close up so you can see the king is sitting there and there's the sun in the picture. Okay, showing the sun worship came from Babylon. Here's the walls they were talking about, the Ishtar Gate. That's in the Pergamum Museum. They dissembled it and they put it back together and they put it in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. I've been there and I have pictures of me uh, leaning on the wall. 
these dragons you see, there's bulls and dragons put in these beautiful tiles, about 545 of these, they're called reliefs, and they estimate that's how many there were, it's massive, beautiful tile work that they used. This is the processional street, it was about 75 feet wide, and once a year they would march down this street and they would enthrone their god Marduk into another year. It was like their year, uh, New Year's parade. Okay, this is an artist's concept of the Ishtar Gate and people marching in the parade. This is a reality of the actual um, street. Now you can see, if you look in the picture that was before this one, it had a jagged wall on the side when they reconstructed it. This is what's left actually in Babylon now. Babylon is about 54 miles south of Baghdad today, okay? It just gives you the background and the history. Now, here's the same wall reconstructed over in the Pergamon Museum, and you see it going out and in, okay? So they've reconstructed it. I'm giving you the background and the history so you understand what we're talking about when we get into it. This is called the throne room, okay? This particular picture, and this is the throne room lion. I'm going to give you a close-up of that because that will be significant. When we study the prophecies of Revelation, chapter 13, and it gets into the beast, the beast is made up of three different symbols, if you remember what they were. A lion with eagle's wings, a leopard, and a bear. Well, right in Babylon, their symbol was this throne room lion. There's a close-up of it. In Daniel chapter 7, it mentions the, the lion with wings as a symbol, as a beast, representing Babylon. Well, that was the symbol of Babylon. This is the throne room lion. I've touched this guy. Daniel probably leaned against this and saw this when he was there in 605 under Nebuchadnezzar. So this isn't speculation. This is the symbol of Babylon. This was their power, the lion with eagle's wings. And when we get to Daniel 7 and we cover that prophecy, as we go down through it, I'm going to talk about parallelism. Parallelism, it means that God repeats himself in prophecy sometimes. In Daniel 2, there's a skeletal outline of prophecy with one symbol. And then you go to Daniel 7, and there's more meat on the bones, so to speak, more details. And you bring up, this one comes in there. Then Daniel 8 gives us more details. Then you go to Revelation 13, and there's even more details there. <laughs> Parallelism. It's the same message over and over and over. It's like God is saying, do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? And you can't miss the message because if you get the first message, it's the same here, it's the same here, it's the same here, even though it's different symbols. And that's a phenomenal thing. Once you begin to understand all the symbols, you say, wow, they all say the same thing. It's the same message. And that will become clear as we go along. That's why I wanted to show you some of these slides. Okay, there's the picture again of Babylon. All right, let's start our lesson. All right, now let me pass out these lessons. Or Mark, you can help me a little bit with this. Here's the first lesson on Revelation. Let's see. Yep. Oh, there's a bunch of them stacked up here. You've got two lessons here. You can pass out both of them. One right now and then the other one. We'll hold off till a little bit later. Oh, here's the second lesson. So... Jerry, just bring that one up here. We'll not pass that one out yet. We're not into that one. Thank you. Okay, that's just lesson one. It's got two pages. That's what we're going to cover now. So you have all the text and things like that from Revelation. All right, here we go. Notice what it says. It's the revelation of what? The book of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's revealing Jesus to us, okay, which God gave him, John, received this vision on the Isle of Patmos in the cave of the Apocalypse. I can take you to that cave where he received it. I don't have that picture with me, but I will show you Patmos and the cave of the Apocalypse where he received this vision, which God gave to him, John, to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So Revelation reveals things to come. That's what the book is about. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 105, and that's in your notes, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Okay? All these things happened to them as examples. They were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. God wants us to understand these things and look at the past so we can understand where we're going. 
2 Peter 1.19 tells us about prophecy. It says, We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star rises in your hearts. Okay, Revelation 1, 1 and 3. It says it's the revelation of Jesus to show us things to come. And then there's a threefold blessing. Notice it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear and those that keep the things are written in it. It's not just good to know it, but God wants us to follow what he says in his word. Okay, that's the introduction to Revelation. And then Revelation 22, verse 7 and 10, talks about the second coming. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. He said to me, do not seal the words of prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now, in our class, I think it was last week, or the week before, we talked about Armageddon. And one of the questions that came up, I think Eunice asked that. He's not here. He's probably wandering around looking for the class because we usually meet in my office, but I figured we were going to grow a little bit today. He asked, was Revelation ever a sealed book? No. Revelation has never been a closed book. Daniel was sealed until the time of the end. The longest time prophecy in the Bible, and we'll get to that, comes out of Daniel chapter 8. And it ties right in with Revelation, and it's an introduction to a lot of the messages we're looking at. But Revelation's never been sealed. It's in symbols to preserve it because it gets pretty pointed with the messages about what people are doing when they're not teaching the Bible and how they go astray. And if it wasn't in symbols, people would have taken the Bible and said, where's Revelation? And ripped it up a long time ago because they didn't like what it said. Okay? So it's to preserve it that God put it in symbols so we can understand the symbols and we're going to go slow enough to figure out all the symbols in Revelation. In Isaiah 28.10, it tells you how to study the Bible. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Match everything in the Bible, make sure it fits. Knowing this first, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of people that get on TV. You can watch on Sunday morning, and one says one thing, and 30 minutes later, someone else is saying it means something else. Somebody may say, oh, I think this beast equals Russia. Someone else says, I think it means China. Well, I won't guess at it. I will show you the background and history, and you'll have no doubt when we're done what it means and what God is trying to tell you. Okay, both Daniel and Revelation refer to a city called Babylon. I'm taking you to Babylon, okay? They refer to the river Euphrates. It's mentioned in both places. Babylon's fall is mentioned historically and in both of them. Beast-like creatures, image of the beast, forced worship. Let's make get rid of that. I should have my phone turned off. Okay. Forced worship is in both books. A death decree in Daniel... It talks about a death decree in Daniel chapter 3 where the three Hebrew boys went into the fiery furnace. They were under a death decree. Revelation talks about a death decree in Revelation chapter 18, forced worship at the end of time. You're going to see the symbols and how they fit and how it flows. The victory of God's people, God's remnant, and Christ is mentioned in Daniel and in Revelation. So very similar messages. Okay, in, De in Matthew 7, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me turn this phone off. There we go. Then we'll stop coming in. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So it's not because a person says, I'm spiritual or I'm religious, but it's if you follow what the Bible says. Many say they follow, but they really don't. That's why we're admonished to study the Bible, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to talk about how to interpret the Bible, let the Bible interpret itself. Okay? Here's a prophecy... 
And the reason I'm giving you the backup is Revelation says the same thing these other verses say. So I want to show you it's a message all through the Bible as well as in Revelation. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Well, that's currently happening today, very much so in many areas. Okay. Now I want to take you to a story in the Bible, in the New Testament. Jesus has been crucified. And the disciples were devastated because they thought he was going to be a political deliverer. And he walks with them onto a road called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And he actually gives them a Bible study. The King James Version, in verse 15, says their eyes were beholden or restrained so they couldn't recognize Jesus. Why? Because they didn't want him saying, oh, you're Jesus, won't believe anything you say. He wanted them to listen to what he was saying and evaluate the study on God's word, not on his physical presence in among them. So he gave them a Bible study. Well, this talks about his method of Bible study. It's the method that I wrote my first book on called the ABCs of Bible study. It comes right out of this chapter. Okay? This is what the disciples said, that we're following Jesus. They're sad, they're confused, and Jesus walks up like a stranger, and they don't know who he is. And so he asks them a question. How come you're sad and walking along? And they turn to him and they say, don't you know everything that's been going on? Well, of course he knew everything, but he plays dumb. And he says, what things? Like he doesn't know. <laughs> it's so cool. And he listens to them. And they tell him about their false theory. We were hoping our Messiah, Jesus, was going to deliver us from the Roman yoke of bondage. We were hoping he was going to be the Messiah, but he died, and we're sad. That's the story of what's going on. Okay? Where do false views come from? Well, it might come from your hope or your feelings about something. I don't feel that that's right. It might be popular opinions. What's popular in Christianity today? It might come from a tradition, and it might come from a misunderstanding of a Bible verse. We're going to look at all those and base what we believe on the Bible, okay? Here's one slide that's messed up. I'm sorry for that. Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. What did he do? He gave them a Bible study. What subject did he pick? He picked the subject that was where their interests were. Messianic prophecies. Beginning with Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible. The prophets are the next ones. So Jesus began going through the scriptures verse by verse saying, wasn't the Messiah supposed to do this? Wasn't he supposed to be born in Bethlehem? And they went all the way through him. He gave a Bible study. Okay, so I start my theory, and this is my theory, the ABCs of Bible study. A stands for the assumption God doesn't lie. He doesn't contradict himself in the Bible. He doesn't say women are saved in the Old Testament, men are saved in the New Testament. He doesn't say that. If you wear red, you're saved. If you wear black, you're not saved. He doesn't say that. Everything fits together. We assume God doesn't contradict himself. Here's all the verses that back it up, and they should be in your notes. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. I am the Lord, I change not. The scripture cannot be broken. He cannot deny himself. God that cannot lie. It was impossible for God to lie. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variables, neither shadow of turning. Fast enough, Mark? <laughs> yes. Very impressive, Pastor. Okay, I can go faster. I'm not trying to go too fast. Remember what he did. Now remember, this is Jesus giving a Bible study to his disciples. Beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures that everything they wanted to know about the Messiah. So, he went through the Bible. B is believe the big picture. Okay? If you take anything in the Bible, and you line up all the verses on any subject in the Bible, heaven, hell, death, the rapture, the mark of the beast, the seal of God, any subject, you'll find out something. I know, because I did this in my first book, ABC's of Bible Study. The majority of verses always point towards one conclusion. We call that truth. 
it gets us started in the right way. So B is believe the big picture. But sure as the world, C is considered the context. And what is that? There are some verses that appear to be contradictory from the majority. A couple, they're in the minority. And sure as the world, somebody somewhere builds a whole doctrine on one or two verses and they throw away the majority. And they don't look at the background and the history and the context and say, oh, that's a controversial verse. It can be taken this way, which I agree, or it can be taken this way. And you know which way to take it because you've got the majority pointing you in the right direction. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the method of Bible study that I use. ABC is a Bible study. I want you to understand that so we stay away from error. Because all churches don't teach the same thing. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, or correctly interpreting the word of truth. And then Acts 17 says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they received the word with all readiness, and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether they were so. God wants us to study. All inspiration is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. And that's why there's a blessing that says, Blessed is it to hear, the read, the hear, and keep those things. Okay, questions. Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. Any questions? That's the first lesson. I tried to go through it fast so we can get through the second lesson. Mm -hmm. We'll see if we can get through this. Basic background, history, that kind of stuff, and then get into the deeper subjects, which I think all of you want to know.